What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here today. I'm your host, Ted Faton. And if this is your first time listening to this podcast, first, thank you for the time. Secondly, this is a podcast about living a fulfilled life and a happy life. We always say life is hard, but it's worth the squeeze. You have to go through the storms. You have to go through the hard times to really live the life you want to live and get to your goals, which in turn are your sunshine and your rainbows. Joining me today, I'm really excited for this episode, uh, Kenneth Hughes. And uh, I, I love it because, Kenneth, you love to d describe yourself as a triple minority, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about this. I'm excited, too. It, it's my pleasure. And I know there's a lot of folks listening right now kind of thinking to themselves, D did he just say triple minority? <laughs> 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 who is this guy? Why don't you introduce yourself uh, and, and let the listeners know who you are and what it is you do? Well, I'm a little extra, so um, <laughs> you did forget the E in my name, oh. Kenneth E. Hughes. Kenneth E. Hughes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. not going to make you say the E every time, but, you know, <laughs> just the first introduction. All right. Yeah. You I'll put say that in the again? show notes. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me today, Kenneth E. Hughes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, so I am a triple minority. Mm -hmm. um, what that means is I'm black, I'm blind, I'm gay. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of stuff, right? Oh, yeah. You don't know. Too many people who have that minority status. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I'm still here, man. I'm still sitting here. What's up? <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. Well, um, I am from Chicago, Illinois. Okay. Um, well, a suburb of Chicago, Aurora, Illinois. Uh, I did live in Chicago before I um, moved south. Uh, I um, do stand-up comedian mm -hmm. in the upstate area. I produce comedy shows. Uh, my production company is called 2020 Productions. Mm -hmm. I currently have a show called Slice of Funny okay. at a pizza place called Todaro Pizza. Um, I do a show in Clemson called Clemson Comedy Night at the Clemson Area African American Museum. That was a lot. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, CAM for short. <laughs> <laughs> I like or it's it. C-Triple-A-M. So, um, yeah, a little more about myself. Um, you know, with um, all of these um, disability titles, uh, I am blind. I uh, lost my eyesight due to a, a retinal disorder called mm -hmm. RP, retinitis pigmentosa. A lot okay. of people can't say that. I'll allow you to say RP. Um, it is something you're born with. Um, however, I did not know I was born with it. Uh, well, if, if you want to kind of maybe unpack that, let's jump into, the, I guess, how that came about, if, if you don't mind. I don't. Yeah. Um, so... It's very um, uh, interesting, um, that, that story, because I didn't know that I had it. It's a uh, um, hereditary degenerative disease, mm -hmm. and you're born with it, and you lose your vision over the course of your life. However, you lose so little that they don't actually know you have it. And um, there were things that were very challenging for me mm -hmm. uh, in, in my teens, in uh, early adulthood, I um, wasn't good at sports. Okay. I didn't know why. It was very frustrating. Um, but I couldn't catch. You know, I'd get hit in the face with the ball. Oh, wow. um, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. So, you know, I kind of shied away from um, certain things. I, I struggled to find something that I was good at. Uh, I was pretty good at track, actually. But um, things started getting worse, and I didn't know what was going on. I remember thinking that I needed glasses. Mm -hmm. And I kept passing eye exams, and um, I went to see a doctor, explain what was going on, did some tests. They said nothing was wrong with me, but I knew something was wrong. Yeah. Then I learned um, that I was a bad driver. I did not understand why I you know, try to do everything just like everyone else, follow yeah. the signs just like everyone else. And I had a lot of car accidents. So that was a very stressful time. Mm -hmm. uh, very scary. I be should say. Frustrating too, because like you mentioned, you, you didn't know why. And I didn't know why. You yep. know something's wrong and you're trying, uh, you're, you're, I have no doubt you're trying your best. And to kind of have these outcomes, you're like, well, was there any time that you thought, well, what's wrong with me then? Exactly. Um, lots I didn't I, I had no idea what was going on it's very frustrating when there's something wrong you know something is wrong but you don't know what it is mm -hmm. and now in the meantime you know I'm, I'm entering adulthood so 
there's already challenges there. You know, adolescence that, is stressful yes, enough. Yeah. yeah, stressful enough. Exactly. And I remember um, I had a job when I was um, 18. Okay. And I was supposed to watch for contaminated bottles, and they were always getting past me. Oh. And I didn't know why, but that was one of the uh, frustrations: is people thought that I was just careless or um, lazy. Yeah. Um, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, all these things are very frustrating. Oh, you just need to pay attention. You need to do this. So it was. Uh, it, it, it did a lot to my self-esteem. So did and you find that people started labeling instead of, I mean, to no fault of their own. Obviously, they couldn't understand, but you felt maybe people started labeling along the way, and you're mm -hmm. like, well, that I'm, I'm being attentive here. Yes. And it was kind of like falsely, yeah, falsely accusing, I guess. Yeah, uh, exactly. And then also, um, you know, being made fun of as, uh, for being a bad driver or uh, not a very good athlete. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, those things are uh, embarrassing, but it was also very scary because I totaled several cars. Yeah. I don't know many people who said can say that they've totaled several cars. Yeah, I've had a lot of near misses, and I remember – knowing something was wrong not knowing what was wrong and and, and I, forgive me if i'm all over the place no, um, no, you're right on you know. you're right on track <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's hard to follow a timeline i was in um college and i was um struggling mm. i remember reading or attempting to and losing my place on the page oh, and wow. you know how it is when you're you're studying so i um hated school for that reason yeah it was just frustrating. I, something you can't explain, but you feel like an underachiever. Mm -hmm. And that does a lot to your, um, your, your self-esteem. But um, I remember that uh, United Airlines was hiring. And <laughs> he was always traveling all around the world. And I'm like... Is he a roommate? Not a roommate. Oh, just a, a friend. A friend, nice. a friend of mine. Um, and um, I applied, got the job. And kind of lied to myself. I said, oh, I'm just going to take a break off for school. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a year off. I didn't go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hear you. Um, but what's so funny, um, the reason why I brought up that job was because it led me to find out what was happening. So I, I passed the interview. There was a, you know, you had, they had an open house, about 60 people. Then they select about 15 people mm -hmm. for a second interview. Then the third interview is a one-on-one. -on -one. It was a, 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 a sort of a process yeah. you know, to get the job. Anyway, um, before we started, we had to go through a physical. Yeah. And I remember it was a basic physical, but the lady who um, performed the physical, she said she noticed that I'm colorblind. She said, you know, you might be colorblind. So one of the stipulations is I had to see um, to go to an uh, ophthalmologist um, because she said I needed glasses. And then mm -hmm. I said, I knew it. I, I knew I needed glasses. The whole time. So, yeah, because, yeah, you know, I was telling people I needed glasses and they say I didn't. So that's all I wanted was, you know, to get glasses. Mind you, I'm 21 now. So the doctor said that he saw something on my retina that he could not explain. There is some discoloration. Hmm. And he referred me to a specialist. What's your thought process when you hear that? Because, I mean, imagine you're going for your dream job now, uh, American Airlines, or you want to fly all over the world, and, and you you almost get a little validation, like, oh, maybe you should go get, get glasses. You're like, thank you. That's, that's what I need. And you're, you're walking in to potentially get your fix, right? This is going to fix me. And then they say, I see something I can't explain. You got to go to a specialist. What is What's going through your mind here at 21? Well, because I'm only 21, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't the most responsible thing. You know, you wanted that um, that fix or mm -hmm. that Band-Aid. Like, oh, I just needed glasses. Yeah. So that visual aid was what I needed. I just wanted the job, and I wanted glasses, and I didn't take the other information all that serious because I just thought in my young mind, well, this is all I needed was glasses. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see a specialist. I didn't 
I didn't know the importance in that at that time. Uh-huh. I was just going through the motions to get um, the 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 job that I I wanted. So um, now I have classes. Now I have the job, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I uh, got based in Philadelphia, um, right out of training, and I was there for a year. And then I wanted international flying and our Philadelphia base, it was only domestic. So I transferred to San Francisco after a year. Nice. And my whole goal was to travel the world and live in as many places as I could. And real short, um, when I was working at United Airlines, you had to stay in one particular base for six months. If another base opened, then you can transfer there. So that was my goal. So after three moves in a short period of time, I got over that really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was like, going to say. Hey. You know, it takes six months to get settled. Yeah. And, and then once you're co- comfortable, it's time to move again. huh? Y- yes. <laughs> and then, you know, after living in California, it was so expensive. I'm thinking, like, where do the regular people live? Like, <laughs> So that's how I ended up going back to Chicago. It's like, okay, I'm over that. Yeah. But um, so in the meantime, I, you know, now I'm going through things of having to explain why I have glasses on and they're not working. Mm. So that did not correct anything. And still very frustrated uh, and uh, still very embarrassed. So many different emotions. I, 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 you know, for lack of a better term, I, I can say that it was not only frustrating but embarrassing because now I have glasses on mm-hmm. and they don't appear to be doing anything. Yeah. And, you know, I talk about feeling inadequate or being deemed careless or um, reckless. And I, when I really got serious was when I went through a railroad track mm-hmm. and the arm came down. Wow. Smacked the windshield. I was just driving, jamming the music, and bam. The scary part about that is I don't know how close I was to the train. Oh, my God. I don't know. I didn't see the railroad arm coming down. I didn't. I just drove right through. That scared the life out of me. Oh, I can imagine. So now I'm, I'm you know, developing bad nerves. And... Um, I'm not ever going to make light of this, but there are certain things that happened after that, that I'm not proud of, but I hit a elderly woman Mm -hmm. crossing the street that did something to me. Um, and I hit a little girl. These people are fine. Okay. It wasn't, there were, there were no fatalities. Yeah. But it still hurts. Yes. Not only that, it was scary, and it was not, and it wasn't just about me anymore. I didn't want to hurt another person. I I went and I got my, um, I made I found a specialist, and they ran all these tests on me, and now I am really, if I say excited, that sounds strange, yeah. but I, I you know, I'm looking forward to get to the bottom of it. So when he tells me that they discover what happened or what is happening to me and, you know, uh, you're in the doctor's office, you know, all the tests have come back. And this was, a, you know, uh, not a very simple process. I, I was um, living in the suburbs, but they sent me to Chicago, Rush Memorial Hospital. And how old are you at this time? Because I know you were 21 going into American this Airlines. It was United Airlines. Oh, United, yeah. United. It, um, now this is about three years later. Okay. Yeah. This yeah. is about three years later. Um, still early 20s, um, but everything kind of happened really fast. Yeah. So um, he tells me that I have a uh, retinal disorder called retinitis pigmentosa. And in a strange way, I was relieved. Because I, f- nothing about that is happiness, but I felt like now I know what's going on. Yeah. So I'm like, what's the cure? And then he tells me that there is no cure. And I'm like, oh, well, 
what do you mean? Like, you know, like, yeah, that, so what now? no, like we did this. I went through all this to find out what I have. Now we got to fix it. So then I had to process the fact that there was no cure. But still, even with that information, even though that it's not good news, I still felt better hmm. that I now know what it is. I felt like I can did take, it, go ahead, I'm sorry. I feel like maybe you were freed almost like from, because yeah. I think something you said a couple times was like not knowing, not yeah. knowing. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's one thing to know something's wrong and not know what it is. And now that you know what it is, at least it's, it's almost like you're, you're free yeah. of that, that darkness of not knowing what it is. Yeah. It, it, it was, I always say, like, it made it easier for me to take care of myself, mm. to protect myself, you know, because mind you, up until this point, all the 20, however many years of my life, um, I think I'm about 23 at this point. I've been trying to do everything um, just like I thought a young man should do. Yeah, yeah. And now I know why this is happening. Mm -hmm. Now, wait a minute, you know, now I know how to be careful, you know. So what were the, I guess, the following steps after... Uh, your acceptance into it and I guess heading into not just your acceptance to thriving in in terms of everything you've started now well the process was first being more aware mm-hmm. being more aware at that time I found out that I had RP but I wasn't considered legally blind at that point I just have the diagnosis okay and I you know I you know I st- stopped doing certain things the same way mm-hmm. you know eventually i stopped driving at night or and you know I, I, that was a hard time to get other people to understand what's going on with me because people don't know mm-hmm. um when you tell somebody something they don't understand if it doesn't affect them directly and when it comes to um visual disabilities people don't understand what that means they think you're supposed to look a certain way well obviously i don't feed that satisfaction <laughs> so i say you know what i can't drive at night Oh, yes, you can. It's fine. You're just putting on. Um, that was another thing that I had to go through. People thought I just liked attention. Oh, man, really? <laughs> like, why would you pretend? Like, I know you're a sex symbol and everything. But <laughs> <laughs> so, I need to clarify that. I love attention. Yeah. <laughs> I did not create <laughs> a retinal disorder f- to feed that attention. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> So um, it got to the point where I could no longer drive. And I was waiting for uh, the doctor to tell me when that was just how we do. You know, I was waiting for that day where the doctor tells me, you know what? You can't drive anymore. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. I stopped driving on my own again. It wasn't just about me. I didn't want to hurt another person. Yeah. Uh, I told you some of those examples where. You know, I still feel really bad just talking about them. Yeah. I remember the last day I drove um, fall around this time, 2006, I was going to go visit my mother. I put the dogs in the car and I couldn't make any left turns. Wow. So I drove all around the city until I finally got back home. And it was, it was a scary time. Yeah. And and, and um, I don't talk about this that often um, to people, but I developed anxiety Mm-hmm. which I learned later that it's that's common for people who lose their eyesight. But those were some pretty anxious times, you yeah. know, dealing with things like that. So a couple of years after that, struggling at work, I didn't know. It was very similar to the fact of when is it no longer safe for me to drive a vehicle? No one told me that. So... Now I'm at work thinking like, well, I just got to do my job the best that I can. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I'm not going to say concealing it, but it was just not something I just talk about. Oh, you know, I'm losing my vision, by the way. I'm not going to be able to work here anymore. Yeah. So there was certain incidences at work and I was really uh, anxious about 
uh, emergency training. We had to have uh, something called RET, recurring mm-hmm. emergency training, once a year. I was always afraid of failing that, like not going to be, not seeing something. Yeah. The thing with RP, obviously, you can tell that I s- still have vision. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is you don't, people will say, well, when were you no longer able to do this and that? There's not like an easy way of measuring yeah. the loss of vision. It kind of just happens. So that's a part of the, you know, the fear in that, you know, you're doing other things. You don't actually know um, the transition. I hope I'm using the word. You won't be able to do it anymore. Yeah. And I remember I was working on a flight to Paris. Um, Certain of, a few of my closest friends knew what I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, I'm not going to be able to work here that much longer. I think it's really getting bad. But I didn't talk about it with a lot of people. And I was flying with a friend and I, it was, you know, when you do the international flights, they're longer, they turn out the lights, people go to sleep. Yeah. And that was always very uncomfortable for me. I hated doing services in the dark. And oftentimes they, flight attendants would like you to turn off all the lights because they want people to go to sleep. Yeah. And I would like always lobby to at least leave the lights on until the service is over. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I ended up burning a lady with hot coffee. Oh, no. And I'm like, okay, I think it's time. Yeah. I had an appointment to see my specialist, and then that's when he told me, you know what, you are actually legally blind now. And it was one of it was just like in the past. I knew it. I knew something was going on because, you know, that struggle that we're always going back to. Yeah. All those uncomfortable, challenging situations. So... Um, I don't know how far we're gonna like delve off into this. Sure. <laughs> I mean, we could we could talk about the transition from from leaving the job okay. to finding comedy. Oh, you yeah. know, because I mean, uh, that, I think that's a it's a good point, kind of like shifting the mood a little bit, right? Okay. Because okay. I mean, we <laughs> Kenneth, you've been you've been through a storm. You know, we 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 just got through this storm. Let's start talking about the, the, the rainbows of finding comedy and, and kind of building um, 2020 productions and, and everything you've, you've been working towards now. Yeah, we talked about the rain. Let's talk about the rainbow. Yeah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey it, it's okay to get wet because the rainbow's always there and the sun's going to dry us off, right? Yeah, yeah. You know. I'm a talker. I yeah. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Can't so you yeah. tell I have a podcast? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so... I am now living in South Carolina yeah. uh, um, with my partner and our dogs. Nice. And I'm in the house a lot. Uh, you've met me um, fairly recently, but you can obviously tell that I'm a very social person. Absolutely. So being in the house was just difficult. Mm-hmm. Like I felt like I needed an outlet. And I, you know, I lived in cities that were larger than this where I can get out and move out about, you know, the yeah. transit systems, very accessible. And when I moved to Greenville, it was a little different. You know, the city is not that walkable. And I felt like I needed an outlet. And, you know, I'm, I'm always doing silly things. I like to make people laugh. I like to entertain. Um, so I would create videos and send them to uh, friends and family. They yeah. pretended that. It's burdensome, but they love it. <laughs> <laughs> they still open it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I, you know, I'm a silly person. I felt like I needed a comedic outlet. Yeah. And I Googled Greenville Comedy. And then that's how I found uh, Alchemy Comedy Theater. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with them? I am. Um, yeah. I have many friends that are still there. They do improv. And I took Great class. show. Yeah. I love the improv show. It's <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. I, I studied there. Took improv classes. I didn't know what I was doing. I just jumped in head first. I remember the first day of class. I, I, for some reason, I thought it was going to be more of, um, I didn't realize it was going to be so um, hands-on right away. I just thought we were going to be sitting there listening to a lecture, mm-hmm. just learning about improv. Had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember um, having to get up and perform day one. I'm thinking <laughs> like, oh, my God, if I could see, I probably would have left but i couldn't find the exit yeah so i'm like i'm trapped (laughs) (laughs) anyway it worked out it was good for me nice so um i loved it and um 
doing improv, I remember at uh, Alchemy Comedy Theater, there, I'm sorry, excuse me, Alchemy Comedy Theater, they perform downtown at Coffee Underground. Mm-hmm. And in the same theater, on a different night, there's an open mic called No Expectations. Okay. And I was talking to some of the other um, students, and we dared each other to do it. It was about That's six of us. That's how it starts, right? Yeah. It starts with a dare, like, yeah. oh, you won't do it. It was about six <laughs> of us. Two of us showed up. Wow. I was going to chicken out. I'm like, no, I can't do this. A friend of mine did not let me back down. We went a couple doors down to Ink and Ivy, had a couple of shots. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a little liquid courage. He but said, that's, that's, that's an accountability partner, right? Oh, yeah. He said, if you don't do this, you'll never live with yourself. He made it really extra and dramatic. He of was course. just like, this is your one shot. <laughs> it's like, but he's serious. <laughs> he was really serious. He made me do it. And I got up there, and right when I got my first applause line, I knew that there was no turning back. Yeah. I was like, oh, man, this is what I want. <laughs> as nervous as I was, I, I it's like an addiction. I loved it. Yeah. It's like I love doing stand-up comedy. When it ended, I couldn't wait until the next week to come back. Yeah. So yeah. your friend was right. <laughs> he said, this, this is do or die. This is yeah. your shot. It, yeah, it, and um, I, I'm I'm really grateful um, to him for it. Can and I say his name? Yeah, his name is Eric Nearman. <laughs> okay, yeah. Eric, you out there? Good job, homie. Shout out to Eric. <laughs> Next time you buy me shots, <laughs> that's awesome. And you've been on many stages since. Yeah, I st- so so I started doing open mics. Yeah, started going there week after week. Um, you know, um, like I said, I enjoyed improv, mm-hmm. uh, and I, uh, many of my friends. I still do it. I, I love seeing them perform, and occasionally I will perform with them. But I felt very passionate about stand-up. I felt like I found the outlet that mm-hmm. I needed. And I remember asking a lot of the guys, because you see a lot of familiar faces. Some of the people show up week after week, and you know you become friends with them. So I'm like, okay, what's next? They were like, oh, you keep doing open mics. And I'm like, well, then what do we do? Yeah. They're like, well, go to Comedy Zone. They have open mic. So we start doing that. Then what? Well, maybe somebody will see you and put you in a show. And I'm like, well, how often does that happen? Mm -hmm. And they were like, not. Not too often. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So then I'm like, well, what if I start doing my own shows? I love it. So that's how I came to 2020 Productions. You know what I love about that? I love the fact that you're you're looking for the next thing, you know, and then what, and then what? Because I think a lot of people they they get comfortable and they get complacent, and you know, with you know, no pun intended, they don't see the dream, they don't see mm-hmm. what's next, right? Mm-hmm. And it's it's just like they're like, oh well, we keep doing standups. You're like, no, there has to be something. And then when you realize they're like, oh, this doesn't happen often, you're like, well, why don't we just create it ourselves? Well, yeah, and and no disrespect to any of them, but a lot of them were just comfortable just doing open mics and i felt Mm -hmm. like well we have a lot of talent in this town like yeah i think we can showcase it more broadly than just at a signing up on a sheet and 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 getting five minutes yeah i i i I wanted to do showcases and i i felt like those five minutes would go by really fast yeah (laughs) i would be getting into it and i'm on (laughs) stage i'm loving it I feel like I have the audience, and then it's over. It's like, man, I got the light already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, I had to come up with techniques for the time because I oh, didn't really? see the light. Yeah, there's okay. it. <laughs> I, I always wondered how comedians <laughs> were like, that's my time. I'm, I'm good to go. Like, where's the clock? <laughs> Someone's shining a light at you. Someone shines a light in the back. Yeah. So what's your, what's your hack for you? Oftentimes, um, I will have my phone in my pocket. Oh, okay. I'll vibrate, and they will call me. Ah, nice. So yeah. a little vibration. Yeah, there's been times where there'll be a little clap. Someone came and like tapped me on my shoulder. Script scared the crap out of me on stage. Oh man. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's di- different techniques, but most of the time, um, well, when you produce your own show, mm-hmm. I don't get the light anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just do it. This is my show. Yeah, I got this. Yeah. I just, but yeah, obviously I'm respectful to the other comedians, and you know, there's, you know, time restraints in any show, but um, it. it 
when it's my show, it's not as important for me to chop it off at right at a, um, when there's a, a, a minute left or if I've gone over a minute, it's okay. Yeah. So um, what's your favorite thing about comedy? Make people happy. Yeah. I find pleasure in that. Yeah. Y- you know, I just entertaining is, oh, I, found, I, I feel like I'm sounding corny. I was getting ready to say, oh, you're just bringing people joy. But it's true. It is. That's a a very fulfilling thing. Like, uh, you know, I I, I never want it to be, like, cathartic. Like, it's just for me. I just have to blow off some steam, and, you know, I'm up here, and and it's just a good outlet for me. Obviously, (laughs) it is, but I feel like I didn't do my job unless people tell me they enjoyed the show. So I'm not pleased until... Someone says that was great. Nice. That was funny. Yeah. Because I mean, how else would you know? I mean, we can all just get in front of a mic and just start ranting. Mm-hmm. So that's what I like. Uh, I like the most. Nice. Uh, it, it's it's a weird. Um, it's, it's a very strange uh, idea because you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position. Mm-hmm. You're putting yourself out there on purpose for people to judge you. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> have to have some reward for that. And that is it for me. Yeah, the, the people, the like people. It. Yeah, and as as um, a a black blind gay comedian, have you felt any restrictions? I know we kind of touched on this before the episode about like you know you, you don't feel any um, hard restrictions, but has there any been you know aside from the the light or the five minutes or, or whatnot? What challenges do you feel right now? Do you feel any? Well, I can tell you this. Um, I'm 42 years old now, and I used to be a very shy person. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't know if it was based on um, things that have happened, circumstances, or just innate. I used to be very shy. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other insecurities. Obviously, um, we talked about me being a, a gay black man, you know? Yeah. There's a time where I was ashamed of that <laughs> yeah and didn't want to admit that or pretend that I wasn't and I, I hit it I did lots of things too mm-hmm. and, and and not only trying to hide it but just not wanting to be that yeah so out of all the things that I've gone through including losing my vision I feel life is too short to just not be who you are what you are how you are the way you are and so with that being said I'm proud to say that I'm very comfortable with who I am Mm -hmm. so I don't feel a lot of restrictions I I I'm happy that I'm in a place that I can say that in this microphone to you being broadcasted because I remember there was a time where I was very ashamed of it insecure about it Mm -hmm. and just to just afraid if somebody could just tell me um or, or I'm sorry ask me yeah. certain questions I would clam up because I'm like oh uh, you know I have to answer uh, accurately they're gonna think I'm gay or you know that was when I was in the closet now that I'm not even then it's like oh are you seeing anybody okay what kind of lie am I gonna like yeah. tell to get out of it um I didn't even realize we we're gonna touch on that but that <laughs> has a lot I mean this is my life that has yeah. a lot to do with the way I behave now now I I don't care Nice. Uh, I don't say that arrogantly. Mm-hmm. I say that confidently. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah. No, like, it does. Like I, I appreciate that I'm here. I'm happy that I'm here. I feel yeah. like I don't have any time to waste. You know what I love about your story, and as I've listened from the beginning, when you're first, when you know something's wrong, and I wrote some of these down because you mentioned like people saying you're. It, they say things that make you feel inadequate, mm-hmm. reckless, um, careless, and you know. And obviously, it, we, we joke about it. Yeah, triple minority, or, or, or not even good, not good enough, not good enough. Why can't he catch? Yeah. Why can't he hoop? And you know, as a these, black man, all these, <laughs> he yeah. can't play basketball. He, he can't on. dribble. It's <laughs> yeah. like something's wrong with me. Come on, man! Yeah. But all those labels they throw at you, right? Yeah. And and coming to this point of the interview, I love what you just said because that was your symbolic shaking it all off for the for the listeners at home everything that s- people have said everything that people might have thrown and and along the way one of the frustrations when you said you don't know so you're like what is wrong with me all that that was thrown at you you shook it off and and quite frankly it's not like no 
I'm not a gay, black, um, blind comedian. I am Kenneth E. Hughes, sex symbol. <laughs> that's <laughs> and, right. And I like that's it. such a uh, that's such a powerful, powerful place that you've come to, because like we mentioned, you know, the, the rain into the rainbows. I could I could see you you have your rainbows, but there are a lot more. Yeah. In your future. I appreciate that. What are you chasing now? What are you, what are the goals that, that you're going yeah. for? What are your rainbows? 2020 vision. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. You don't have to have sight to have vision. That's going to be the name of this episode. And, and you know, you know, like the things that I talk about, yeah. all the things that I talk about, things that I in the past seemed like it was such a challenge for me. Mm-hmm. Now I talk about it with ease and with pride, you know we touched on so many different topics you know we went to my vision we talked about me being gay um you know just being a black male you know i had to deal with people saying oh you know you're not black enough you're not this you're that you know um well so i talk about everything that i talk about on stage i love that i'm comfortable with that because i not going to let anybody else define me yeah i'm not going to let any of these things hinder me like me being visually impaired i refuse to stop being who i am i refuse to stop being social Mm -hmm. Um, i love to sing even though i don't have a great voice Um, (laughs) i enjoy it i love to dance Um, i love to entertain and i i just refuse to slow down and i feel like i'm in essence accelerating yeah like i don't have any time to waste that's keep speeding up <laughs> keep speeding up well kenneth how can folks find you connect with you catch one of your shows well, uh, what's the best way for them to follow you i am on facebook mm-hmm. uh my handle is 20 slash 20 productions mm-hmm. i am on instagram nice as 20 slash 20 productions sc Nice. I have to have the slash there because they just put 2020. It's not me. Yeah. I don't know if I had to be that specific, but <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> that's how I put all the links in the show notes and everything, too, okay. so folks can have uh, have the link straight to it. Yes. So. I'm 2020 Productions, Facebook, 20 Productions, SC, Instagram, 20 Productions. I'm sorry, 2020 Productions on Twitter. Nice. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm having a good time. I love it, man. I, I can't wait it. for you to come out and laugh with us. Yeah, I'm going to have to come out because uh, yeah. actually my fiance Jeff, she just said the other day we were driving by Todoro Pizza, and she's like, oh, we've got to go back to that pizza place because we went for their lunchtime brunch. Oh, once. you did go? Yeah. Yay. And it was delicious, and she's like, we got to go back to that pizza place. And I was like, baby, let's wait till there's a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So we're going to have to take you up on that here. Well, in can the I talk to you months. a little bit about Todoro Pizza? Yeah. Okay. So my friend um, – um, his family owns that restaurant. Yeah. They're so from New Jersey, right? They're from New Jersey. Oh, yeah. Great people. Um, you're from the East Coast, right? Yeah. Northeast. New York. Long New Island. York. Okay. Long Island. All right. <laughs> well, he, um, Christopher does, um, Christopher Todaro. Yeah. I met him doing improv at Alchemy Comedy Theater. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, I begged him to do stand-up with me. Mm-hmm. Like, dude, because he's hilarious. I'm like, you need to do stand-up. So his said way to doing stand-up was... Um, uh, hosting my shows um so i, I consider him my comedic partner mm-hmm. and um he had a todaro pizza in clemson that he opened up about eight years ago um so he opened one downtown greenville with his brother and i was doing shows around greenville already but i'm like you guys should let me do comedy at todaro pizza and so he did that's how i ended up awesome. there so yeah and I'm, I'm excited for that area, too, because they're really building up around it. And Tadaro Pizza has been a um, great spot. We can't wait to get more pizza and catch one of your shows. Kenneth, man, thank you so much. I think your story is very inspiring. Oh. It's, it's very, it's very thought-provoking for anybody out there that thinks they might get the short end of the stick, right? Anybody that might think um, these labels people throw at them define them. I, well, they I, don't. I appreciate that. And, you know, you are really um, – a great interviewer. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, and I say that because you make it, I don't know, it's almost like therapy. Like, 
you know, just coming here, I didn't know how I was going to open up. I just <laughs> felt like I had something to say, and you gave me the opportunity to say it. But, yeah. man, it was well, just great. Honestly, <laughs> man, um, the whole purpose of this podcast is kind of selfish. I love these conversations. I love learning about people, and I love hearing these stories because it fuels me up. And the microphones are so our listeners, if they're interested and they'd like to get to know us as well, they get to sit in that space with us. So I, I thank you for being vulnerable. I thank you for sharing your story. And uh, I think a lot of folks need to replay this to learn some insight from you because um, I think you've, you've done amazing and you're just getting started. Thank you. Yes. Next time we do this, this is part one. Next time I would like to have some alcohol, some cocktails. Yep. You know. <laughs> Good deal. Yeah. That's my some, fault. <laughs> some snacks. Some snacks. Some <laughs> I, I, I got to feed you. <laughs> yeah. No, no, just, just the alcohols. Got you. <laughs> I'll have the cocktails. <laughs> well, Kenneth, thank you so much. And, and to the listeners that made it to the end, definitely hit this again and play this again. Thanks for listening. And as we always say at the end of the episode, everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain. But you can't get the pleasure without a little pain. Let's grow. Beautiful. <laughs>